brain is a fantastic machine. It's the most complex machine we have ever run into. It's just an amazing piece of work, and uh, what it can do, it's still something we're trying to find out. When I talk about this research to a lot of people outside the university, a lot of people feel like very futuristic, like Star Wars kind of thing. And I think we are very close to uh, really uh, understanding how the brain actually works. <laughs> Brain-computer interfaces are first and foremost aimed at helping people with disabilities, in particular people that either have no ability to control movement at all, they cannot move, they're paralyzed, or they're so uncoordinated that they have difficulty using standard devices like mice, uh, joysticks. And so in this case the idea is to tap directly into the brain signals and allow a computer to watch those brain signals and guess what the person intended to do. And so people can control whatever device through a computer just by thinking. The goal here is to help disabled people. Uh, of course, to further explore and understand the various processes that go in the human mind. The subject is just going to look at the interface and play a game. It's uh, the hangman game. There is a missing letter in a word, and they can try just to find that letter. And uh, they're using the BCI interface to do that. So they move right, uh, and they imagine right hand movement. And once they pick, they want to pick the letter, they imagine a, a foot movement. And when that happens, if it's the correct letter, they would say, good job, you've, uh, you've played the game well. Best subjects are the ones that are able to relax and not think about the, the, the task. Just relax and do it. And so in some sense, you can train yourself to relax if you want to do well, but you can't train yourself to do it well, just by hard brute force. The older systems were only based on the idea that the people are going to learn how to use it no matter what. But if you actually have more intelligent algorithms in the system, you can actually speed up that process because the system will be learning as well, not only the, uh, the subject. Yeah, so the idea is that anybody, the, the goal is that anyone can do BCI. Exactly, that's the goal. It's uh, good fun to be able to come up with something, hook yourself up to the computer and be able to uh, move a robot or spell something. You're actually controlling a robot or a wheelchair, then of course there's a lot of excitement in that. You feel like a kid. <laughs> what we're tapping into it's very simple. You have your brain's billions and trillions actually of nerve cells and when they're working they transmit electrical signals. So what happens is that at any time when your brain is executing a particular task, a mental state, uh, uh, thinking about something, whether it's conscious or not, you have electrical signals going by. Basically they're voltages and electrical currents that we can detect. There are different types of waves. Some can be more easily recognized. Uh, there are others only generated in certain circumstances and uh, in particular if the uh, subject is interested in what's happening on the screen. And these are known as the P300 waves. They are difficult to detect, but um, you don't need any prior training to generate. They are naturally generated by the brain where, wherever something interesting happens on the screen. The P300, which is another one, which again you're gazing at something specific and as it flashes you carry out a task to that flash and that task generates a signal that happens here. The brain is evolving as we speak and so as we're trying to understand it, it's already moving on to the next stage. It's a known fact that the brain signal changes over time, even within the same session it might change. So we designed this interface in order to give us indirect information that will help us and help our models adapt over time. To make these systems work, you have to actually understand how the brain reacts to things. So there is also a scientific challenge here, which is to really understand how people react to stimuli, um, what makes them 
such stimuli interesting and, and how you can build BCIs that are non-intrusive. There is reluctance to work with uh, implanted devices in this university, mainly because it will require annual experimentation. And so there's uh, an issue related to social responsibility, uh, and there's some risk involved as well, unfortunately. Another reason for doing it, and that's one of my main motivations, is that non-invasive technology is much safer and cheaper, which means it would be a lot easier for people to have access to it, whether they're disabled or not. And so we're talking about people in the games uh, areas and people in third world countries uh, that either cannot afford uh, an implanted system or would not need it. For example, why would you have an implanted chip just to play a video game? Maybe one day people will want that, but I think we're far from that at the moment. Now with the game industry stepping into it, everybody's talking about it, and there's more money available. Whereas before, when uh, we had a focus on disabled people, it's a very small population, hospitals with very limited resources, and so we didn't have a lot of research money, and we didn't get a lot of attention. Commercial applications are very, very useful in accelerating pro progress. We just need to keep in mind that quite often, because of the commercial interest, the science suffers. Uh, but I think that overall, everybody benefits from it. It's a good idea, uh, unfortunately, because I, um, a lot of us are aware already of um, the limitations of external, um, externally placed electrodes. Um, and also, if you, if you know the emotive system, it has a gyroscope inside it. Um, and most of the control that they achieve is either through muscular control, which is much easier to detect, or uh, the gyroscopic um, motion of the head. So the, the head moves and the gyroscope is able to, or the accelerometer is able to uh, detect that and interpret that to, to achieve control. So it's not really BCI work, were there? It is strictly no. If you think about the very long-term future of this, we're talking about 20, 50 years or more, when uh, one day people will be using this technology on a routine basis, I believe, just like mobile phones nowadays. And so we will see a number of uh, processes that will be very common. The very focused attention will be one of them. And uh, I do believe that as we use more machines and we focus more on things, yes, the brain will become more efficient. We'll be able to switch off more easily as you can practice with that. Having said that, uh, we also have to look at our environment as a whole. And what we see is that we have more and more gadgets in our lives. And if you look at it, the teenagers today, for example, they have a very hard time concentrating on things because the gadget has so many features. And so I think uh, people are going to switch from both states. One state in which they're completely focused, they're good at doing that, and eventually when they're not doing that, they're going to be multitasking a lot more than they used to in the past. People are worried that we can actually read their brain, you know, uh, but I think um, uh, the technology has not matured to that point yet. So we can't actually say you're an you know, intelligent person or, or you're like a humorous person based on these signals. So we have not actually come to that point. Uh, in, in any case, that's not our uh, aim as well. Um, so people don't really need to worry about that. You know, it's not that we're trying to read their brains or anything. We're also harnessing the power of evolution in evolutionary algorithms. This is an artificial form of evolution within the computer. We have such powerful computers these days that we can actually run some sort of evolution to help us design the difficult parts of, of brain-computer interfaces. If we let our minds open up a bit, it's possible that some specific frequencies or signals that we produce in the brain might reach a bit longer. They might go beyond one or two centimeters. That's a possibility that uh, I personally would like to explore at some point. Brain is something very interesting. Uh, being able to untangle that and to be able to have um, further answers to the various questions about the human brain, about cognition, is something that is very much interesting to me. When I was doing uh, my master's degree, I went into a poem by Emily Dickinson, which has since become one of my favorite ones. And it summarizes my view of this whole thing. It's about the brain. So the poem goes like this. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain, and you will be